Well, welcome once again, everybody. This is uh, session eight in our class, life school, forerunner school class uh, called Understanding the Forerunner Call. And uh, the title of this session is Forerunners as Master Builders. Uh, so if you'll remember from the last session, session seven, we talked about forerunners as end time messengers. Uh, this, this session and teaching is about forerunners as wise master builders. And if you remember in the last session, we connected the two because uh, they are very closely connected, messengers and master builders. Uh, messengers uh, are invite and uh, do other things, but their primary role is to invite people into a new way of relating uh, to Christ based on his uh, purposes for that time and season. And in, 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 in the end times, we're speaking of very specific things to be made ready for Christ's second coming uh, and the various events leading up to that in the context of his second coming. So that was the, uh, the theme last time of messengers. And as we talked about in that last session, we looked at the Apostle Paul and how he functioned as a messenger uh, and as a wise master builder and how the two functions were connected where messengers go in and invite and then um, for those who say yes and respond positively to the invitation, then wise master builders then equip and prepare them. Uh, and the, 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 the phrase I'll use in this session a good bit is that they will create a spiritual environment a proper spiritual environment for the truths that have been invited, people have been invited into by the messenger will flourish and will bear fruit. And so that's kind of the, the way that the two functions operated. Now we know that, that Paul, he went and he spent sometime just a few, few Sabbaths and sometimes he spent months with people in a messengerial role but then he spent years at times and wrote letters and other things <coughs> to people to, in the master builder role to create the proper uh, spiritual environment. And so those two things do function uh, very closely together. But in this session, we want to look in a little bit more detail at the role of forerunners as wise master builders. So let me pray and invite the Holy Spirit to take control of this teaching and then we'll dig right into it. Of course, your notes are, are there and you can get more information uh, there as well. So Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the wonderful group of people you're assembled to uh, being prepared as forerunners. And we ask, Father, that you would give us a, a fresh and a deep uh, vision of what it means to be a forerunner as a wise master builder that we would understand these things, that we would know how to function in that role, Father, and that we would desire it and want it and ask you and allow you to equip us to be forerunners, not only as messengers, but also as wise master builders. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, let's dig into this. We want to uh, talk first about the fact that we're called as, as master builders in addition, forerunners are called as master builders in addition to being messengers. Uh, and we look first at the Apostle Paul who functioned as a wise master builder. Let me read this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where he calls himself that, uh, that person. He says, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation." And another is building upon it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he talks a lot about the foundation there, that one, the foundation, the only foundation, the only foundation is Christ. Uh, and you think, oh, I know that. I learned that in Sunday school. But you would be amazed, and we, you know, when you begin to think about it, what is being taught in the global church, there's probably uh, almost, uh, there are more churches building on foundations other than this person Christ than has been built upon him. Uh, so that's the foundation. But then it says that 
Paul laid a foundation, you know, that foundation of Christ, and another is built upon it. Uh, and so, you know, we all function. One gets some revelation, another gets an, another revelation, but there's a building function uh, in the body of Christ, uh, Paul being that wise master builder. And so the church has to be built up. I mean, even Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this. The role of the fivefold is to build up the church uh, into a, a mature man. And we talked about that in the previous session. So we see that there is a function uh, as wise master builders. And forerunners operate in that function. They come as messengers first to invite. And then for those who say yes, there's, a, there's a, uh, an assignment of, of being a builder to build them into that proper spiritual environment. Uh, that bears fruit in the truth that the messenger introduced. Uh, so that's what the role uh, of that is. Um, Elijah also uh, functioned as a, as a wise master builder. Uh, so if you will look at uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 30 through 35, and I want to, I want to read this because this will be important. Uh, Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and, he, and he, look what he did. This is before he called fire, he prayed and asked God to bring fire from heaven. Because the fire from heaven came onto this altar that he built. But look what it says. And so all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying Israel shall be your name. So with the, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did and a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did a third time. The water flowed around the altar and he filled the trench with water. So now I want to deal a little bit with the different aspects of this. But the point, the main point is that Elijah, before he confronted the prophets of Ahab and the prophets of Jezebel, before the people really turned back to, uh, to Yahweh, uh, before fire came down from heaven, Elijah's task was to restore this altar that had been torn down. So the altar to Yahweh in the northern kingdom had the true altar, the real altar that honored uh, uh, Yahweh, and we take it into the New Testament type, and making this a type of the New Testament things, the true altar of the Lord has been torn down in many, many places, and it's been replaced uh, in this case with Ahab, Baal worship and uh, Asherah worship. Uh, even before that, uh, the golden calves and all the things that were there were, were uh, had pushed out the true altar of the Lord. And so Elijah, what his role was, uh, before he could confront and do the things that we all kind of connect to the story and we remember the most, he had to restore the altar. He had to repair the altar. Uh, now look what all he did. Um, there are a lot of types and shadows here uh, about that. Uh, you know, the... The stones represent, there are 12 of them, which represents uh, all of Israel. And for us, for the full house of God, the stones for the church, for the full church and house of God, we need to see the house, the, the, the altar restored. Um, we see the wood uh, on, the, uh, on the cross, be, our wood on the altar being a picture of the cross. We see the ox being a picture of Christ and him sacrificed, him crucified the, to the, introduce the, the cross, basically. Again, we're talking in types and shadow form here. The cross being restored. Uh, the trench uh, uh, with the two measures of seed suggests the, 
a double portion of the word, restored altar from where the word of God freely flows, um, the, the water being a work of the Holy Spirit. So you, you could go on and spend a lot of time on this types and shadows. But the point for here is that Elijah not only spoke, he not only spoke into Ahab and into Jezebel and to the people as a messenger, he clearly did that, but he also worked, functioned as a wise master builder restoring uh, the altar. And, and so just like we've said in all these things, just like uh, Paul, just like Elijah, forerunners are to function uh, as wise master builders. Um, now let's look at this issue of restoration. Um, if you look at Matthew 17, uh, starting with verse 1, really, uh, I won't read all of it, but this is, it starts out with a transfiguration where Jesus took, uh, I think it was John and James and Peter up to the, up to the mountain and he was transfigured before him, before them, uh, into his glory. Uh, and then aside them, aside him, was Moses and Elijah appeared, talking with them, with him. And so here's what Peter wanted to do. Peter wanted to. He answered and he said, "Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here: one for you, and one for Moses, and one." For Elijah, he's going. To, I'll make basically. I'll make three houses of God, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. Uh, but then immediately, while he was still speaking, uh, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, "This is my beloved son, to whom I am well pleased. Listen to him." And so. What, were they, what was the Lord saying? The Lord was saying, it's not Moses and not Elijah who are, is preeminent, it's Christ. It's Christ who is the preeminent one. Don't build a, an altar of worship around Moses and Elijah. We worship my son, the Christ, the, the Messiah. Uh, and so anyway, when that happened, Jesus was the only one uh, left. And as they were coming down, uh, you know, Jesus warned him not to share. But then in verse 10, he said, And disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Because, he, you know, the father had said, It's my son, not Elijah. And Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming. And here's what I want you to hear, too. One other thing I want you to hear. Elijah is coming and will restore all things. Now, at this point, we've already we said this in a prior session John the Baptist had already been martyred by this time but I say to you that Elijah already came in the person of John the Baptist but they did not recognize him but did to him whatever they wished so also the son of man is going to suffer at their hands then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John uh, the Baptist and so th there's several points here uh, but you know one of the one of the points is that it's uh, it's all about Christ, restoring uh, all things, p about exalting this man Christ above any other person, any other issue, any other thing. Uh, but also the issue of restoring. Uh, Elijah will restore all things. He will restore those things. He will repair that altar that has been torn down. And so he'll do that in the end times. There'll be that forerunners will be used as God restores the true altar of the Lord uh, in the end times uh, where, there, where there has been a drifting from that where many other things uh, have been uh, put in its place. A, a major aspect of for, the forerunner call as a wise master builder is to restore Christ in the hearts of the people back to his preeminent position, to restore the cross back, uh, to restore these things back uh, so that uh, people will be made ready for him in his, at his second coming. Uh, so there is a major assignment, not only 
as messengers, but also as master builders to bring restoration to these things. There's a need for a different spiritual environment. L listen to that now. This is a major assignment of a forerunner as a wise master builder. There is a, a different, there's a huge need, tremendous need for a different spiritual environment in the church than is there right now. This is true all over the world. Uh, there is a need for a different spiritual environment. Now we want to talk a little bit about that in just a minute, what some of the, the needs are, the different needs. But first, I, I want to just, again, I did this in the last session, but I want to just review again what, where we're headed with this, what the goal of the master builder is, what he's restoring. And again, we use these five purposes of turning people back to Christ, turn them back to the person of Christ, we talked about that. Turn them back to God's eternal purpose. Turn them from focus on external things back to the internal kingdom. Turn the hearts of leaders uh, to back to their spiritual children away from their own self-focus and self-interest. And uh, turning the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. Those five things. And there were three objectives that we listed to go along with that of making uh, people ready as a corporate man, a mature corporate man, making people ready for the end times, to so be strong in the end times, and making people ready for eternity. So that's kind of where we're headed. Ma messengers function with those goals in mind. Master builders function with those goals uh, in mind. Uh, so in the context of that, um, there are several things that wise master builders uh, must do and, and because of the need there. So let's look at a little bit more in the need. Um, first, much of the church has man at the center of its ministry rather than Christ. Man is at the center of much of the ministry rather than Christ. Now, you may not think that, but you begin to uh, really pause for a minute and analyze what is being taught uh, the focus of many churches, uh, man is the center. Uh, you know, the even salvation. Uh, now, I'm obviously salvation is absolutely necessary, and I'm so thankful that uh, in 1977 I was born again. And uh, I hate to think where I would be right now if I had not accepted Christ is my Lord and Savior. So I'm not minimizing the need for salvation, but God's eternal purpose is, beyond, is more than just salvation. Uh, there's, a, there's a purpose in God for God's glory, God's purpose, God's good pleasure that even uh, uh, is more than that, more than just salvation. But you see it in other things too where uh, you know, the prosperity gospel and all, all of those kind of things focuses on man getting wealthy, man getting, making a lot of money, uh, on a man getting healed and health, uh, getting prophetic words to tell him how great he is and all those kind of things. Uh, th those are man-focused, man-centered issues that are, that are in the body of Christ. They're all over the world in the body of Christ. There's other streams where the whole issue is to help people make it from one week to another, help to get over depression and help to uh, uh, do those various things. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those teachings. Uh, you know, we, God does want to bless us financially. He does want us to be healed. He does want us not to be depressed. But what's the focus? What is the focus? Uh, is the focus on man? Is that the total focus? Or is the, to is the focus on Christ, on this man Christ? to make him preeminent, to make him central uh, as the way, the truth, and the life, to have Christ in us be conformed into his glory, into his image, draw us into union with him and into, into intimacy with him. That's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, and it's, that's, those things are Christ-focused, Christ-centered, not man-centered. But much of the church is man-centered uh, right now. Let me read this quote from Deverne Fromke in his book, Ultimate Intention. If you're looking for a good book on, uh, uh, on eternal purpose, in addition to my son Brian's book, 
uh, The Eternal Blueprint. This book is a great book by Deverne Frompke, written, oh, probably in the 50s or so, I don't know, 60s or something like that. It's, it's fairly old, but it's uh, really a powerful book. Uh, but let us remember the eternal son and his body of rectified sons are destined to live for one thing, the most complete and supreme honor, glory, pleasure, and satisfaction which they can bring to the heavenly father. So while the father is concerned for his son, the son is also concerned for the father. This is the divine rule that governs all, governs all heaven. It is his intention that all his sons be invited to embrace the divine purpose and f this divine purpose in philosophy of life. See, which is where Christ is the focus and the center. All right, so most of the, the we're talking about the need uh, for, for master builders to return people back to Christ. Uh, second, a significant portion of the church is focused upon an external kingdom rather than the person of Christ and his internal kingdom. Uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit just a minute ago about the where there's an emphasis on healing and signs and wonders and personal prophecy that make uh, believers feel good and accepted, revi even revival, uh, works of service and emotional and financial prosperity have become... Uh, a driving message of the church. So let me just talk a little bit about revival. We've kind of talked about all the other things. But this is really important. Uh, there's such an emphasis on uh, praying for revival and a third great awakening in much of the church. Uh, and we'd all love that. And maybe that will come, maybe it won't. But a lot of what drives that is uh, eschatology. And we have a class that will deal with that. But some of this um, seven mountain eschatology that says that the church is going to occupy the seven mountains of culture before Christ returns, which is a false uh, eschatological view. It's not biblical. Uh, but that call, the only way that could ever possibly happen is, would be this massive revival, third grade awakening that touches every aspect of life. And so, and that's, I mean, we'd all love for that to happen. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what happens is it creates a focus on this external thing that minimizes in a lot of people's lives the need to be conformed into the image of Christ. It's a huge, it's a huge distinction. Um, and so, uh, there's these, there's these ex, it's an external thing. God wants an internal kingdom to be our number one priority where Christ has his people who are conformed into his image. Uh, now, revival can be a part of that. I mean, it would be great if it happens. Uh, personally, I do not believe it is in Scripture, not to the degree that it's being taught. Uh, yes, I do believe there will be a harvest, uh, uh, I think it'll be much like the book of Acts, the second Pentecost on, in the second book of Acts. But if you'll notice in, book of, in the book of Acts, yes, there was power, there was revival, but it didn't transform the culture. It transformed individual lives. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, a little bit off track, but that's, that's that external, we'll get it back to the internal things of God. Now the third uh, need again is uh, is a large segment of the church is focused on the traditions of man and the shadows of old wineskins, believing they are a major aspect of becoming ready for the Lord. Um, you know, you, the traditional church, the uh, the Catholic Church, the uh, a lot of the um, other mainline Protestant uh, type denominations focus on tradition uh, rather than truth. Uh, you see it also with the Messianic movement. Uh, you know, I, I've, I enjoy, we, we, we do a Passover celebration and uh, have a Seder meal whenever with the family as many times as we can. I enjoy celebrating some of those things, but I, the, I want to make this point. Uh, God's eternal purpose precedes the establishment of the law, 
uh, the establishment of the feasts, establishment of all these things. And so sanctification uh, and bringing, restoring is not restoring us to our Hebraic roots. That's not what God is about. He's taken us beyond that to restore us back to his eternal purpose. Now, that doesn't mean we can't uh, enjoy celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles or the, or the Passover or the, uh, or the uh, Feast of Pentecost, and we can't enjoy those things. But the main point of celebrating them is the main way we celebrate Passover is we get born again. The main way, way we celebrate Pentecost uh, is that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and the church is birthed in us. So there, not that there's, there's nothing in those things, but it's the focus. Many people, their whole focus is on restoring Hebraic roots. And they believe if the church is restored to its Hebraic roots, it'll be ready for the second coming of the Lord. No, that's not true. It, it, it's going back to God's eternal purpose, which was created, established before the foundation of the world, but long before there was a Jew, long before there was any kind of a Hebraic practice there. Um, fourth, uh, incorrect eschatological views have taken multitudes of believers off the track of pursuing God's eternal purpose and leaving them woefully unprepared to stand in the pressures of the end times. This is a huge issue. Um, I alluded to it a few minutes ago, but I want to just touch on this a little bit. I've kind of categorized it three major areas. This is kind of my, I mean, some of these terms are definitely being tossed around, but I've used them in my own way, defined them for myself. Uh, victorious eschatology, realized eschatology, and irrelevant eschatology. Uh, the victorious eschatology I talked about is like the seven mountain, uh, that seven mountain eschatology that God, that the church will occupy the seven mountains of culture and then the Lord will return. Uh, just kind of a victorious way. Uh, well, that sounds great. The problem is it's not biblical. It's not scriptural. Uh, and so, but there are multitudes of believers that believe these, these things. This victor the seven mountains is multitudes of believers that believe. And we'll deal with those in our end time uh, class. The second category is realized eschatology or like preterism, full or partial preterism that says that pretty much everything was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when, when Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, the temple was destroyed. And so um, they're saying that none of the issues that are coming in the end times are going to happen. Matthew 24 has been fulfilled. Uh, Book of Revelation has been fulfilled. That some partial preterists believe the Lord will return, but none of the events of the end times will take place or re related to that. And then irrelevant eschatology. There are a lot of people that believe that the rapture is going to occur uh, and take the church out uh, regardless of how mature or believing, how uh, marginal their faith is before anything gets really too bad. Uh, and so these views, eschatological views, are leaving woefully millions and millions and millions of people unprepared for what is coming uh, in, in, really upon us now, I believe, even in this decade uh, that is coming. So, so in view of these things, in view of this, these different uh, attitudes, predominant attitudes in the church, forerunners must build an environment uh, centered uh, around Christ and God's eternal purpose. Now, the issues were a little bit different maybe during Paul's day, but he, that's what he did. Uh, you see it in the book of Colossians. There was all kind of error going on, and what did he do? He called them back to Christ. He said, it's in Christ. The fullness of deity dwells in him. Uh, and it's Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. He called them out of the types and shadows of Judaism. He called them out of the philosophy of man back to this person of Christ. And so mass forerunners <coughs> as master builders uh, have to do that. I love this verse of scripture in, from the book of Colossians. Let me just read it. 
uh, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from, that God, from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, we admonish every man and teach every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Uh, that, that's our goal. Is to be, this is our goal as a master builder, to strive to build, to, to exalt the man Christ and to build a people who have Christ in them in fullness as our hope of glory, becoming a glorious church to be presented to Christ at his second coming. Uh, it's interesting, I, uh, this came back to me as I was preparing this morning to speak this, that this verse of scripture, this passage of scripture, is the life verse that the Lord gave me back in 1983. And uh, you know, honestly, I'd kind of forgotten about it for, for a while, hadn't really meditated on it recently. But then looking back over decades, really, this is the journey he's had me on over all those years to be, to strive mightily, uh, mightily in terms of effort and hopefully the Holy Spirit filling me according to his power to do these things for the benefit of the church, for preaching the word of God that way. And I, it's a master builder function, and I hope you'll pursue it as well. So let's talk about several dimensions of a spiritual environment. I'm talking about spiritual environment now that forerunners have to build as master builders in the lives of believers in the church. And we'll go through these pretty quickly, but there is a, uh, there's, a uh, there's a class on Radical Pursuit website called the Eternal Purpose Church, especially session five goes in, uh, five through 11 actually, goes through this, uh, this uh, teaching uh, about spiritual environment. And if you wanna dig into it more, you can go to that and there's audio videos and notes there, and that's the, uh, and the, the link is in your, in your notes, but it's Radical Pursuit, <coughs> the Eternal Purpose Church is the title of the class. Good class, really. <coughs> um, okay, here's some of the spiritual environment. First, a spiritual environment. And this is, what, this is what master builders have to build. This is the environment that we need to try to create in our churches and in, uh, in individual lives. First, a spiritual environment must exist in the lives of builders in the corporate church in which Christ is preeminent and central. Uh, you know, these other things are okay. The, the, the other things of God are okay, but they're lesser things. It's this man, Christ, who is to be made preeminent and central. That's one aspect. Another one is an environment in which the bride is made ready. Uh, very important. When the, the, I've heard this said, and I believe it. The Lord will not return until the bride has been made ready, Revelation 19.7. Uh, and so there's a real effort, a real assignment uh, to, to master builders to create a spiritual environment in which people will know and understand how to make themselves ready as a bride, a prepared bride for Christ. The third one uh, is for to create an environment for in the church for overcoming sons to be prepared for the heavenly father. Similar to the bride being made ready, sons have to be uh, made ready for the father. S same assignments essentially, overcomers uh, have to be ready. So there's an environment that has to be created. Whether you're talking to one person across the street or whether you're talking to a church or a multitude of churches. This environment there must be created. Fourth, the preceding three objectives to be accomplished, there must be a spiritual environment for believers to grow in intimacy and in union with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So we have to create an environment that that's, that, that's, uh, that, 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 so that, that can be uh, bear fruit in the hearts and in the lives of people to grow in intimacy and in union with the Father. Fifth, in addition to intimacy and union, uh, there, there must be an environment created for believers to take on the nature and the character of Christ in fullness, the nature and character of Christ in fullness, to be transformed into the image of Christ. Uh, along with that, sixth, an environment must be created to embrace the cross, uh, the, the, the cross of Christ, uh, so that because it's the that's the process by which intimacy to our, takes place. That's the process by which Christ is formed in a people, and we become in union with Him through the cross. Uh, seventh, believers are believers to endure the days in which we currently live. An environment must be created to stand strong and to partner with God in the uniqueness of the end times. So we need to, end times are important. I mean, that's part of where we live, and so. There needs to be an environment for people to understand a proper understanding of that and the, 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 the temptations of falling away in the last time so that people will be strong uh, and to, to be a voice and to be a partner with God in these times. Uh, the eighth thing is a spiritual environment must be created uh, to the vision of the church to give believers an accurate vision of the judgment seat of Christ, an accurate vision of the judgment seat of Christ, eternal rewards, and eternity. Not many people in the body of Christ understand that idea and is really, really uh, important there. So those are kind of eight things uh, that, that, are, that an environment's kind of show you kind of where we need to, as builders, lead the people to. And so there's one more section on this, uh, approaches of a master builder. And I think there's like five or so different aspects of this. What how does a master builder function in order to produce that spiritual environment we talked about uh, in other sections? Approaches as the, of the master builder. Um, first one is the master builder must provide knowledge of the topics they are calling people to. John the Baptist provided uh, Luke 1, 70, chapter 1, verse 76 through 79. He provided knowledge of salvation. To the people and you know even in Daniel it says those uh, who have insight will give understanding to the many uh, again another aspect of the forerunner call and so knowledge is important people uh, might be willing to to say yes to all these things but unless they have knowledge of how uh, to do it then they won't know what to do how to say yes to it and all. so that's very important that as master builders we teach them the precepts of how to and, and understanding what's involved in these things so that they individually can say yes to them and walk with the Lord and uh, allow him to deal with them in these various areas. But knowledge is crucial uh, in this. Revelation knowledge is crucial there. Second, forerunners functioning as builders uh, must patiently teach on the topics uh, that we've talked about. Patiently teach. Uh, let's just, let me just read a, a few uh, quotes or passages related to, to Paul. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, this is Acts 15, 35. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They were teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. They were preaching and teaching. They went back to their home base and they preached and they taught these things. Uh, also from Acts 20, verse 18. Uh, for the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. So he, he declared it, but he also taught. One more of these verses. Uh, and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters, and he was welcome in all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness uh, and unhindered. Uh, you know, even toward the end of his life, uh, Paul, when in, in 2 Timothy, which is the last book that he wrote, 
He was writing it to Timothy. He said this, for which I have, talking about himself, said, for which I have been appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Uh, so he was teaching and, and patiently teaching the people to give them the knowledge that they would know how uh, to say yes uh, to these things uh, and how to implement them into their lives. Third, the forerunners functioning as wise master builders must devote considerable time to show people how uh, to become the messenger, to become what the messenger calls them to be. Uh, and so Paul, talking about Corinth, he settled there for 18 months teaching the word in Corinth, okay? And they and he wrote those books, First and Second Corinthians, and there was another one that's not in the scriptures, and there was a lot, those were long books. There was a lot in there about how to get them to, to operate in, in, in truth. And there, you know, there's a lot of things they probably didn't do right, as you know, but, but he taught, he spent time teaching, devoted a lot of time on how to do it. Um, the, the golden altar example that I used uh, in the last session you know, not only do we have to talk about what it, what, what it meant, we had to explain to people how to walk in that, in, into internal purpose prayer. And actually, that's going to be one of the classes in our uh, Forerunner School is uh, becoming an internal purpose house of prayer about how to do those things. So, we, so there's, you have to provide knowledge of what is involved, but also knowledge about how to implement these things. Um, uh, and fourth, uh, forerunners functioning as wise master builders must be patient with whom they are working. And that's a really important thing. We tend to want to get impatient with people, uh, but, you know, as, especially those who are in leadership, uh, you know, we deal with these things 24-7, basically, seven days a week. But a lot of people in our churches, they have, they have to go to work. They have, they have a lot of... Uh, other responsibilities. They don't deal with it nearly as frequently as we do, even though their heart is to, to be right. Uh, and so we must be patient with people to understand these things, help them to understand so they can walk in them. And then finally, the fifth point, the last point, uh, forerunners functioning as wise master builders must also have discernment as to where the people are to whom they are ministering uh, are in their journey. Uh, this is really important. You don't want to get too far. I'm speaking maybe this one maybe more to leaders and pastors and preachers. And You don't want to get too far ahead of the people. You don't want to just pour it on more than they can handle. I know the, the first pastor that I served on, under as an associate pastor, he used to say this, and I think it's really a valuable point. If you get too far ahead of the people, they will mistake you for the enemy. If you get too far ahead of the people, they will mistake you for the enemy. Uh, in other words, they'll think you're the enemy coming against them and that you're in error and you're wrong. And that's true. You, you want to lead the people on, but you can't get too far ahead of where they are uh, because they won't, they'll think it's foolishness that you're teaching or error or worse, uh, whereas really it's not, but they're not uh, there. Yeah. So anyway, you have to have discernment on what, even though you may know a lot of things, you have to have discernment on what to teach uh, in order to become uh, this uh, master builder that builds the environment that exalts the man Christ and, and, his etern and facilitates his eternal purpose being fulfilled. So anyway, that's the forerunner as a wise master builder. We have forerunners as end-time messengers and forerunners as wise master builders. I hope that you will uh, say yes in whatever uh, anointing God empowers you in to be a messenger and or a wise master builder. Uh, in the next session, the next session nine, we'll look at forerunners as intercessors and spiritual warriors. So God bless uh, and thank you for your attention.